Hey, welcome. We are doing some things a little bit different tonight as we join you in this night of worship. Uh, one of the things we're really trying to accomplish tonight, to be super honest with you, is just to give some of our men and women a break who have been working super hard during this Easter season. We've had a lot of services and a lot of recording, a lot of video going on. And so between the two Wednesdays that book in Easter, we just thought, let's do something different on this Wednesday after Easter. Give some of our men and women a break and in the same time, just doing something a little bit different. Hope you enjoy this night as we worship together. This will be a little different, but we will in the same capacity in the same way worship our Lord together. And so grateful that you're here with us tonight. Enjoy this time and let's worship together. I was buried beneath my shame Who could carry that kind of weight It was my tomb Till I met you I was breathing but not alive All my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you You called my name And I ran out of that grave
light of the world you step down into darkness open my eyes let me see beauty that made this heart adore you hope of a life spent with you here I am to worship here I am to bow down here I am to say that you're my God you're all together lovely all together
For your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head I will sing Of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful All my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able I will sing of the goodness of God I love your voice For you have led me through the fire In darkest nights You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend I have lived in the goodness of God all my life all my life you have been faithful all my life you have been so so good with every breath that I am able I will see of the goodness God, your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Oh, with my life laid down, I surrender now, I give you everything. God, 
His mercy is more. What riches of kindness he lavished on us His blood was the payment His life was the cost We stood neath a debt We could never afford Our sins, they are many But His mercy is more It's an interesting question sometimes when people ask us, is it worth it? Is, is the amount of time you put into that uh, project worth it? Is the amount of money you spent on that car worth it? Is the amount of uh, sacrifice you made to, to be a part of that team worth it? And it's, it's always interesting as we start to evaluate, sometimes even after the fact, is something worth it? I heard a story um, just even last night about um, a merger that didn't happen and back in the year 2000 for Blockbuster was the was the was literally the giant on the block when it came to any kind of movies and video rentals. And so, if you're old enough, you may remember this. If not, but there was a day when all videos were seen through like a VHR, VCR. And that's how Blockbuster started. And they were the first ones to have these superstores where you could actually rent movies out. It didn't come through the internet, but you physically took them home, played them in a little device. And so, Blockbuster was making billions. At the, and at the year 2000, they were worth about 9.1 billion dollars. There was this small startup company that no one had really ever heard of called Netflix that was starting to make a little bit of a dent in the market. And what they were doing was, for the first time, not only sending you videos to your house through like CDs and stuff, but they were also experimenting with letting you download videos that you could watch on your computer. It would take all night to download the thing, and then you could watch it the next day. Well, they were going bankrupt because it just wasn't working for them. So the owners of Netflix went to Blockbuster and said, we want to sell you our company for $50 million. Well, the executives in Blockbuster at that time just as they worked through the deal, just thought, this is ridiculous. We're gonna buy a company that really we're not gonna make that much money off. This is just gonna benefit them, even if we own them. And at the end of the day, we're gonna lose money. Blockbuster said no. Netflix came back five times trying to sell themselves to Blockbuster, and every time Blockbuster said no. If you flash forward 23 years, Blockbuster is bankrupt, no longer existing. They're talking about coming back into the marketplace. I've heard that recently, but they don't exist. Netflix now is worth $147 billion. Now, if I bet you went and sit back and asked those executives now if any of those guys are still alive and women from Blockbuster, hey, was it worth it not spending that $50 million? They might have a different view on what they did and what they didn't do. But at the moment, they thought, man, this is the right economic decision. This is exactly what we need to do. I just want to encourage you today as we step into this word from Acts chapter 8. Sometimes evaluating is it worth it is really difficult, um, especially in the moment, the heat of the moment. We're going to see this. The church is an intense persecution. It's picking up. And as we saw a couple of weeks ago, right before Easter, the first martyr, if you will, the first person who dies for the name of Jesus happens in the, in the person of Stephen. And the intensity of the persecution, what's happening in the persecution is way up. And when moments like these become super intense for us, we start to ask the question, is it worth it? 
And tonight I just want to answer that question for you as we look in the Word. Is, is following Jesus worth it? So let's walk through this together. I'm going to read the whole passage to you, and then we're just going to break it down. We'll do this a little different maybe than we would in a normal sermon on Wednesday night and because we're a little bit more casual here sitting together. There's not an audience. Nobody's laughing at anything I'm saying. So I just want to do this as we're sitting in a room together and talk you through this passage. This is Acts chapter 8. So if you have a Bible, grab that with you, and we'll walk through this together. Um, this is Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 1. It says, And Saul approved of his execution, approved of Stephen's execution. Saul, by the way, is going to be our friend in the future, a guy named Paul who actually gives his life to Christ in a few chapters from now. But at this point, he's an enemy of Jesus and he's overseeing the murder. I mean, ponder this for a minute, the murder of a follower of Christ. We'll get way more into that in the future, but I just want you to hear this right now. He was the one who was orchestrated, um, ordained, if you will, and even carried out this execution. Probably didn't cast any of the stones himself, but was there. Saul approved of his execution. There arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered through the regions of Judea and Samaria except the apostles. Now devout men buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. But Saul was ravaging the church and entering house after house. He dragged off men and women and committed them to prison. Verse 4, now those who were scattered went about preaching the word. Philip, by the way, Philip, this is the Philip who was partner of Stephen who had helped the widows back in Acts chapter 6. Uh, be ministered to as some were being um, not adequately fed through the, the food that was being brought to the widow. So Philip was one of those men they had picked, full of the Spirit. Philip now, like Stephen's getting to go out and preach, he goes down to the city of Samaria as he's left Jerusalem and proclaimed to them the Christ. He's out preaching now, right? Verse 6, And the crowds were with one accord, paid attention to what was being said by Philip. And when they heard him, they saw signs that he did. For unclean spirits were crying out with a loud voice, Many came out who had them, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And verse 8, so there was much joy in that city. Let's walk back through this a little bit together, beginning in verse 1. It says, Saul approved of this execution. Here's, here's the first thing. I just want to walk through a bunch of things tonight about is it worth it. And these are going to be kind of made in statements of a cost. Here's the first thing I want you to hear tonight. There, there's a cost to following Jesus. And the first cost we're going to see in this passage is, is death. There's always going to be a death if we're going to follow Jesus. Now, here's the good news. Here's the gospel just straight up front to you. Because of Jesus' death, we get to follow Jesus. It doesn't begin with our death. Our, our death doesn't lead us to following Jesus. It's his death that brings us into relationship with Jesus, makes us right with God so we can be with God. But hear this, please. If you're a follower of Christ by the death of Jesus, it's going to cost you your life. Now, maybe not physically like Stephen here. We, we, you may never live in a culture or time when you have to give up your life physically for Jesus. Maybe. Some of us will. Some people all over the earth are. There's martyrs all over this earth every day for the cause of Christ. We live in a place right now where not necessarily that's what's happening. But every single person that follows Christ is having to die in some capacity if they're going to follow Christ. Jesus said it this way in Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself take up his cross. Now, sometimes we hear that verse, maybe you've never heard that verse, but a cross had one purpose and that was to kill people. It was, an, it was an instrument of execution. So when Jesus is saying, take up your cross, what he's saying is you're going to have to deny and die if you're going to follow me daily was the end of that verse. Salvation is all on Jesus. Let's be really clear about that. It's his death period in Christ. We become his son and daughter, but it's going to cost you your life to follow him. Maybe what does that look like specifically? Maybe, maybe that looks like just your will first. We start having to die to our will and know Jesus' will. It starts looking like our old life being put to death of things that we used to value and desire and want. Some of you are wrestling with that right now. Maybe it's control. Like I used to be in so much control and now Jesus is asking for control in this. Will I die to being in control? Your longings, um, your desire to fix your sins. Sometimes even as followers of Christ, we just want to help Jesus get the job done in our own heart. And you can do nothing to change your heart. We, we allow him through the Holy Spirit to do that. So even dying to that whole reality, dying to self is the, is the path to every bit of resurrection life Jesus wants to give in you. The resurrection life he has for you, though, only comes through death. Think about it this way. Jesus would have not have known resurrection without first dying. And so for him to physically come out of the grave required him to physically die. For us to live in the resurrection life Jesus has for us in our lives, we also go through many moments of death to things so Jesus can then birth new life in us through his spirit. This is the first place. The cost of following Jesus is going to be death. And so I want to ask this question as you hear that. 
as you are starting to die to things or as God is calling you to die to some things in your life, is he worth it? It's the question I'm gonna ask all through the night. As you see the cost, is he worth it? And the first one I want you to hear is following Christ is gonna require death. The question I really wanna ask you and me too, is he worth it? There's more there. Verse one goes on to say this, and there arose that day a great persecution against the church. So the persecution intensifies, right? It's the quantity of it is happening now, not just to the apostles, but Stephen really is called out for us, written out for us as the first person who's not apostle, who's being beat, persecuted. It's really starting to happen to the whole church, as it says, against the church in Jerusalem, and they were scattered. So what happens here is that the church now is being intensely persecuted in Jerusalem. A death has happened. They're starting to, to bring people out of their houses and homes, as we're going to see. And because of this, the church just starts to scatter out of Jerusalem, run. And they're not running just to save their lives, as we're going to see. They're running so they can live, but also so they can proclaim Christ in different places. And so there's like a big hit on the church in Jerusalem, and then it just scatters. It says all throughout, and notice where it goes, Judea and Samaria. And it says, except the apostles, and a lot of reasons people think about why, but mostly it's, it's the apostles trying to hold the church together in Jerusalem and to, to be intact, staying, not to run away, but to stay where the, where the message is first being proclaimed. But I want you to notice this, more importantly, they scattered in Judea and Samaria. Back in Acts chapter 8, verse 1, Jesus told the disciples, when the Holy Spirit comes, you'll be my witnesses, first in Jerusalem. And I think they've been doing that in a concentrated way so that they can build the church up before being sent out. The second two places he said they would go was Judea and Samaria, and so here they go. Now whether they went volitionally or whether they were scattered, God has sovereignly ordained their sending to the next two places, Judea and Samaria. This is a huge thing. Judea basically is the, is the state, if you will, around Jerusalem. So like we live in St. Charles County in the state of Missouri. Jerusalem was the city. Judea was kind of like the state, if you will, of that area. Samaria, on the other hand, was a totally different thing altogether. It was a, a country, if you will, next to uh, Judea, Israel, which was made up of people who were from the past had some Jewish background, but it had intermarried with all the cultures around them. So the Samaritans, familiar with the scripture, were people that the Jews hated. Likewise, the Samaritans hated the Jews. They equally didn't like each other. But it was a place that Jews just didn't go. The only person, the first person, who really started taking the message of, of God through Jesus Christ to the Samaritans was Jesus. It had not gone there yet. And matter of fact, the message of Jesus hadn't gotten to any of the Jews. This is going to be the first time the message of Jesus heads outside of the Jewish population of Jerusalem out into the limits, the, the regions outside of Jerusalem. The first place it's going to go is Samaria, which is super cool because it was one of the most hated enemies of, of the Jews, maybe even next to the Romans. So it says they head off to Judea. Here's, here's what I want you to hear in all of this. There's, there's a phenomenally great persecution going on here that sends them out. One of the things I, I realized that the scripture tells us about following Christ is that part of what the word promises us, 2 Timothy 3.12 promises us, is that if we're gonna live a godly life, that persecution's gonna come with it. It is about as clearly and as literally stated as you can. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus, and listen to these words, will be persecuted. So what does that mean? It means if you and I are, are living in a way that the life of Christ is being reflected through our actions and spoken through our words, that there will be persecution that comes against us. What does that literally mean? It means, the word persecute means to quiet or to mute. And so it means that at some point if you're living a life that proclaims the love of Christ, the mercy of Christ, the truth of Christ, and even the words of Christ, there's, there's gonna be an enemy who wants to mute that. And so persecution comes. The whole reason persecution was coming against the church was to shut it down, to quiet it, to mute it. Here's what you need to know is you're living this out in a workplace or your home, even for some of you, or school or wherever this is, know this, that there's going to be moments when the enemy through other people is gonna to wanna to mute what they feel are words that are hurtful or divisive or ununifying or not inclusive. And, and you need to know this, man, there's gonna be a cost in following Jesus that's gonna come in persecution. The attacks to silence Jesus will take two places in you. One, it's gonna to be to silence Jesus' work in you because well, part of what persecution does is not just cause us to stop talking about Jesus, it causes us at some point to even wanna stop believing Jesus in our own hearts. Like, 
is it worth it to follow Christ? Is he really good if I'm going to suffer? And so the enemy is trying to silence his work in you and his work through you. So it's not just, are you going to stop talking on here? He really wants to mute God's work in your own life. Realize persecution will come. If you're following Christ, the enemy wants to stop what he's doing in you, but also what he's trying to do through you. And it starts to ask the question again in our own lives. When you are persecuted, how would you answer the question? Is he worth it? Is it worth it to follow Jesus? They were all scattered. They get scattered into so many different places. Thousands had come to know Christ in Jerusalem. We don't know how many at this point, but we have two numbers that add up to 8,000 in Acts chapter 2 and 4. There's probably more than this that have come to Christ. Maybe some have left the city who didn't live in Jerusalem, but there's thousands. So now they get scattered. They get scattered in all different kinds of places. They're heading to a bunch of different parts of the, of the country. And here's the third cost I want you to see that, that what happened to these people when they scattered was they lost a lot of things. And, and here's, here's the cost. The cost of following Jesus is just loss. Let me tell you what they lost. They lost jobs. For a lot of them, they had to leave Jerusalem. They lost their jobs. It, not like our economy, not like our world where you can just leave St. Charles, go to Columbia and find another job. And when they left where they were in Jerusalem, they left everything, family, friends, job, the synagogue they were part of, the friends they had, everything they were doing was left to run to get away from the persecution. There was a lot of loss. So let me just say it as practically as I can say it. When, when you and I are following Christ, there will be loss. Um, think about it for some of you. What have, what have you lost in the last years of following Christ? What friends have have no longer are part of your life, what people have ghosted you or canceled you, what people have gotten tired of your incessant voice about Jesus or just the way you love and want to forgive, what people have, have no longer want to hear the things you, you're saying or just be with you because you're not into getting drunk like you were before or just doing some of the things you did before. Here's what Jesus said in Luke 12, 51. And he's saying this a little bit of hyperbole, but in other words, exaggeration, but not always that extreme. He says, do you think that I've come to give peace on earth, just between people is what he's saying. He says, no, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, in one house, there will be five divided, three against two, two against three. And they will be divided father against son and son against father, mother against daughter, daughter against mother, mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law, daughter-in-law against mother-in-law. So he's not saying God doesn't want to reconcile homes. I'm not saying that at all. God's not saying don't pray for your family. God's not saying share the gospel. But what God is saying that in some of our homes, when we follow Jesus, when we lay down our lives to follow Jesus, begin dying to our old ways, there are going to be some people that don't receive Christ that not only reject him, but reject you. And part of the cost of following Christ are going to be some people in our life, some places in our life, some things in our life, maybe even jobs in your life, things that you value. If you follow Jesus, it's going to come with a loss of others, a rejection of others. I had a, a friend make this statement to you the other day. He said, when, when things get tough, you'll see if you married God for his money or for who he is. And you, you've heard that phrase before, right? Like when things get rough in a couple, like did she just marry him for his money? And I think this for some of us, like the only reason really we're saved is because we married God for all the things that he gives us. So did you marry God for his money, all the stuff that he provides for you? Or did you really come into communion with God through Jesus Christ because of who he is and, and what he's doing in us? forgiving us, making us a new creation, giving us a king, someone who, who brings us new life. Um, persecution, trials, like things that stir up loss in the following of Jesus really reveal this. And then it begs the question again, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Verse two, he goes on to say, devout men then buried Stephen and made great lamentation over him. Crazy, just cultural moment here for a second, if I can give you a little cultural moment. Um, a couple of things here. One, when someone was, in the Jewish law, when someone was executed, they were considered unclean. There was a reason they were being executed. They'd, they'd done something spiritually so uh, abhorrent to, to who God was and to who the law of God was that when they executed this person, what was said to the rest of the community was, like, you cannot touch this person. Not will only you become unclean if you touch them, but we need them to just stay where they are hanging on that tree and to be rotted for the birds to eat their bones and their carcass and everything else. And it wasn't just a sign of yuck. It was like, this person is unclean to God and to the community and we can't touch him, don't come near him. And so Stephen has been executed by the Jewish authorities, the religious leaders basically saying this person is abomination to who God is. 
leave him in the pile of stubble, leave him alone, don't touch him, don't get near him. Not only was that a law, but they had made a law in, in the first century that you couldn't even mourn for them, which was a big deal in the Jewish community to mourn for those who had died. You even see that with Lazarus when he dies and all the mourners come out where Jesus comes up and calls him out of the tomb. So there's two things going on in this passage. One, there's men wanting to come bury Stephen, which, wow. Like, not only are they associating themselves with Stephen who's just been executed for his faith in Christ, they're saying, hey, we, we're, we're associating with this person who follows Christ by burying him. But then they're also going against the law of what's the law for the Jews at this point. And I thought about this and I thought, man, you know, I, maybe someday I'd worst, risk my life for Christ, but it's gonna be for speaking for Christ, not burying my friend after he died. Like, you know, let his bones rot. He's gone. He's in heaven. He's with Jesus. He's got a promotion. Am I going to go risk my life to bury my friend? Or am I going to risk my life because I'm talking about Jesus? And I really wrestled with this. And I, here, here's what I want you to hear in this. I think part of the, the cost of following Jesus is sometimes we lose people that are super close to us. And that word, there was a great lamentation over him, was just a, was a statement of there was friends that were that were suffering and hurting so bad because they lost a friend. I don't think these guys that came back to bury Stephen were just random guys who said, hey, let's do the right thing, no man left behind. I really think that these were friends that grieved over the loss of their friend and were so um, rightly grieved that the action that they had to take at this moment was to go against the authorities and to go against everything that they thought could possibly be a risk of them and to say, you know what, we're, we're gonna not only honor our friend, but, but we're, gonna, we're gonna show the rest of the community how much we love this friend. And they went in the middle of this and, and buried a friend. And it's not the risk that really shocks me, it's, it's what shocks me in this whole moment is that some people were so grieved because they had lost a friend. Um, here's here's the, the next cost, if you will. If, if you and I follow Christ, we're gonna lose really close friends. Um, and let me, let me just be morbid for a second, and then I'll bring you back to a little less morbid. Um, if you live long enough, you're going to lose friends because people are just going to die. Uh, my dad's 92, and there's going to be a day he dies. And, and that's, that's a, a good thing in one sense because I know my father's in Christ, and he's going to, again, get the promotion, head to heaven. But it's still going to be sad. I'm still going to grieve the loss of my dad. So eventually that's going to happen if I live long enough to see that happen. He may live to 160. Who knows? But he's 92. I'm 58, that, that day's gonna happen. Um, bring it back closer this way. When I was 30, I had friends that died. Um, cancer, car wrecks, followers of Christ. I had friends that were sent to other places. Like we, we prayed and laid hands on them and sent them off to, to places in, in the Far East and to the middle of Africa or to the middle of uh, China. And, and we prayed over friends that left or just moved from where I was in Texas. I was the one that was sent from Texas to Missouri and I missed friends that I was sent from. And so I've had friends in my life that just really aren't friends necessarily anymore. We're still friends, but we're not close. We're not in the same proximity and I had to leave them to follow Christ. And, and it begs the question, is it worth it? Not just when a friend dies, the sadness of that, but is it worth it to be, to, to be sent out? And I'll say this, there's another way we lose friends. Some just at some point abandon Jesus. And I've had friends in my life that have, that have got caught up in sin and have walked away from Christ for a moment, for a season, for a long time. And here's the truth of, of following Jesus. You will lose people close to you and there will be, if you really are friends with them, great lamentation. There will be great sadness where you cry out to God and say, why? And it begs the question at those moments, is it worth it? If following Christ, and it feels like following Christ makes me just lose stuff, is it worth it? Is it really worth it? I, I want you to hear as we walk through this that what's about to happen next, I think, is part of the answer to this question, which is where verse 4 jumps in. Now, those who were scattered went about preaching the word. So they've been scattered. Judea, Jer Samaria. Philip, the guy who was the friend of Stephen, who started the, the whole ministry to the widows to, to more effectively hand the food out to those who weren't being treated Fairly, as one of those guys, he becomes now a preacher. He gets, gets to get to do a different task here. And he goes down to the city of Samaria. He gets scattered, runs, but he isn't running just to get away from persecution. Now he's going to keep talking about Jesus. He says he goes down to Samaria and proclaims to them the Christ. Man, what a, what a crazy deal. Um, I think about of all the places that, that the Jews would have like put on their list of, like when we're making thoughts about mission trips, 
two things happen. One, we start thinking about where are people we know that we want to go serve and help. And, and then sometimes we're thinking about where, where are we going to go that's going to have an impact, maybe even not just as a one-time trip, but actually send people to places that where nobody's heard. And with that comes this idea, like how dangerous is that going to be? How uncomfortable is that going to be? Are we going to know the language, the discomforts, all of that? And so here's Philip heading to a place where nobody liked Jews, and Philip's a Jew. He's a follower of Christ now, but he's a Jew. So he's heading to a place where nobody likes Jews, Samaria. He's heading to a place where the culture is very differently. He's heading to a place where, where, the, where everything that he knows has been turned upside down, and, and he's having to live now in a place that's not his home. And he's going to be a part of living there, but also sharing Christ there. And I, I just think about the craziness of that, and I think that's not what most of us sign up for. Like when we think about following Christ, we're, we're not necessarily always thinking about where, where am I going to end up that's going to be the most uncomfortable and the most where I'm disliked and the most where there's possibility of even not maybe the same kind of persecution here, but a new kind here. And so Philip runs away from persecution, but then begins to share the gospel of Jesus Christ in the middle of a place where immediately we know from just everything culturally he's not going to just be welcomed with open arms, if you will. So he begins to share, and there's amazing things that start to happen. Verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria, proclaimed to them the Christ. In verse 6, and the crowds with one accord paid attention to what was being said. I mean, they, somehow or other, the Holy Spirit draws a crowd, not just a small crowd, but an incredibly large crowd starts to gather around him, and they're unified to listen to him. And when they heard him and saw the signs that he did, so God's through his spirit is giving him miraculous signs of healing. And it says that unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who had them. And many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. God is moving in power through Philip. And it, it's, it's a crazy moment. He gets sent, power, God responds. But here's what I want you to hear about the cost here. It, it was a sending, if you will, that put Philip in a place of great discomfort, of great unknown, which for a lot of us is a big deal, and great change. And I, I can think of two or three things that make give most of us the heebie-jeebies, make us squirm a little bit, is the thought of change, the thought of discomfort, and the thought of unknown being just what is gonna be our life. Like sometimes we'll like get on a roller coaster and we'll go, okay, I'm going to deal with the change because it's going to be for a moment. I'm going to deal with the discomfort because it's going to be for a moment. And I'm going to deal with the unknown because it's going to be for a moment. But think about this. Like, I'm going to head into a life where all three of those are going to be my norm for the next couple of months, weeks, years. That's what God sent Philip into. And I just want to say this. If you follow Christ your whole life, there will be moments that God sends you. And it will involve all of these. Discomfort the unknown, and very much a very palpable change that's happening around us. So it may not be because he sends you to not Paul. It may just be because he sends you into your own home to talk to your mom about Jesus, to a mom who doesn't follow Jesus. And so think about the discomfort there. Think about the change that could happen in your relationship all of a sudden as you start to bridge that gap of what's been known and how y'all have related for so long. And just think about not just that, but just the, the amount of like frustration that brings into that is the discomfort and the change and the unknown of what relationship can be. Maybe it's not just into your to your home, but maybe it's on the on this team now that you're a part of at a college or a place where God starts to say to you, hey, listen, I want you to to let people know they're who I am. And all of a sudden what has been known is gonna change. The the teammates that you have that have accepted you for who you are could readily change. You're not really sure how this is gonna happen unknown and you know this is gonna be uncomfortable. God may send you literally um, across into a, a new job and get you a new job and you're super excited about this new job and then the Holy Spirit begins to tell you, man, look at all these people around here that I've given you to love on in Christ and speak the truth of Christ. Again, change now coming with some discomfort as you think about talking about Christ and the unknown of what that can bring into a new workplace. Those are all things that are happening to all of us day to day. God is sending us into places that every time he does, change, discomfort, unknown, come with the middle of those. But I think for some of us, he's calling us to, to other kinds of sending. Some of you, I'm just going to be real personal for a second. You've been a part of this body for a long time, or maybe even just a year. But God's been calling you to be sent 
to another body of Christ and to another place. Maybe that's because of job or because school's over or whatever, but for some of you it's because he wants you to carry out a different ministry in a different place. And my question to you is, are you gonna hang on to the known here and the lack of fear here and the lack of discomfort? Are you gonna allow God to send you out of this place, which by the way, we love to do. Yes, there are moments of sadness in that, but we love to do this. But will you go? Will you be sent? Some of you are being called to, to places where the gospel's never been heard, like where Philip went to Samaria, where, where the gospel had, had barely been heard once by Jesus there, but there were no Christians living there, if you will, um, in any kind of capacity to have any kind of church. And so Philip goes there as one of the first to speak to what we would now call an unreached people group. And will you be one of those people? Man, we love, we're, we're part of that right now, raising people up that will go to places where the gospel's not being heard by people who don't know. There are billions in our world that don't know Christ right now. Will you be sent to those places? And so listen, whether it's the phrase we use is neighborhood to nations, whether it's in your own neighborhood, in your own home, or to the nations, God's sending all of us. And the question is, will you go? And when he calls you to go, whether it's into your own home or to a workplace, I'm gonna ask the question again, is it worth it? To follow Christ at this point, is it worth it when he sends you in discomfort and the unknown and the fear of, of all the change that's going to come with that? Is it worth it? Spirit's moving, power. And here's, here's the last verse. I love this. And I think it changes how we hear all these questions. Verse 8 says that after all this is happening, Philip preaching, the signs are coming, people are being healed, demons are being cast out. Verse 8 says this. So there was much joy in that city. There was much joy in that city. One of the, one of the great fruits of the Holy Spirit showing up in people's lives is joy. One of the, the weird things about joy is it's super hard for us to define and really, really talk about what it is, but we see it all through the scripture. And it's, it's kind of a contrast to happiness. And happiness isn't a bad thing. Sometimes Christians talk about, man, we, sh we shouldn't be happy. We should have joy. I'm, I have both. Um, I'm, I'm happy when I get to watch, you know, one of my friends, uh, you know, enjoy a great meal. That makes me happy. It doesn't necessarily give me joy, but it makes me happy. When I see two people get married that love each other, man, I'm happy. When I see a, a little kid hit a home run, I'm, I'm happy. When I see a girl play a note on an instrument for the first time and it doesn't sound like cats scratching the wall, I'm happy. When I see a guy play the drums and all of a sudden he can keep a beat, I am happy. When I see someone paint something that looks beautiful, I'm happy. And so there's a lot of reasons to be happy. Not nothing wrong with being happy. But understand this, happiness is very circumstantial. It's for the moment, because after that home run, that kid's gonna get up and strike out three or four times, and then he's not gonna be happy. Dad's gonna be sad, coach is gonna be frustrated. The other team's happy, but that kid's not, right? Um, happiness is very circumstantial, it's very much in the moment. And it's not bad to be happy, just realize it comes and goes based on the, on the circumstances. Joy is something else altogether. It is, scripturally, it's, it's an internal thing that's eternal. Let me say those two things again. It's internal and it's eternal. And what joy is, is, is a fullness that we get from God's presence that can't be taken. And it's inside of us and it's eternal because he doesn't take his presence from us. And so here's the, here's the thing I want you to hear in this. It says, so there was much joy in the city. Now what's changed between the time Philip's not been there and Philip shows up is what Philip is talking about and what she brings, and that is the message of the Christ and the presence of the Holy Spirit into those that are being saved, that are being claimed by the person of Christ and his work, and are being born again through the Word of God as they trust the Word of God and faith, the work of Jesus. So joy starts coming into that city. And it's not, I mean, when I think of joy, I, I want you to hear this. It is something only God can do, and it is something that doesn't get taken from us, but it absolutely, we have things that steal our joy for sure, because we forget hear this, that our joy comes from the very presence of God. This is what Psalm 1611 says, you make known to me the path of life. So the path of life, Jesus said, is I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That's the path of life. We come in to life with God through Jesus Christ. The way I've said this a lot to us as we've been talking about the gospel is that the gospel is God sent his son to make us right with him so that we could be with him. So the path of life is Jesus comes to make us right with God so that we could be with God. That being with God then gives us this thing. Here's Psalm 1611. You make known to me the path of life. Here's what we get in that. In your presence there is fullness of joy. So the, the good news of the gospel 
so much, but sometimes we stop at the good news of the gospel being we're forgiven. The good news of the gospel is this, we are forgiven so that we can be with God and in God is where we find joy. Not just cheerleader happiness, right? Of like, hey, you can make it today or this is good, but really the joy that is internal and eternal that is greater than the circumstance we're in, that is greater than everything that's happened in all these verses before verse six of the persecution, of the death of a friend, of being sent out, of leaving people and homes and loved ones. Like how did Philip leave that place with joy and proclaim joy and preach joy and then see joy come into people if he didn't have it? If he wasn't living in the very joy of God's presence, there's no way he could have Proclaim the joy of the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and seeing joy enter into a city through the presence of God in people's lives. Here's, here's just so much I want you to hear from these verses. I just want to read these to you as we end. Just listen to the joy of God that he promises through his presence. This is Luke chapter 10, Luke chapter 2, verse 10. And the angel said to them, This is the shepherds out in the field, the angels are coming to announce the one who would bring joy. Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. And he's proclaiming that the Christ is coming. This is Matthew chapter 25, verse 21. Jesus is telling the parable of a, of a faithful servant living out his life the way the master is calling to. And he's giving them a story of how we should live our life. And at the end of that, the master comes to him and says, well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over little. I will set you over much. And listen to what he says. Enter into the joy of your master. Relationally, come into the joy of that you can only find in me. It's not in all that you've done in the serving, but it's in the presence of the master where joy is. This is verse 11 of John 15. These things I've spoken to you, Jesus says, he's talking to his disciples, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Not a little, but full. That my joy may be in you. Everything Jesus taught to them was so they can know, and notice what he says, his joy, his very life in them. This is John 16, verse 24. Until now you've asked nothing in my name. It says, ask and you will receive. And notice why he says he wants them to pray so that your joy may be full. Not so you can get all the things you want that think will make you happy. They go away. But so that you can have this internal, eternal fullness that only comes from the very presence of God, joy. This is Psalm 21, 6. For you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. Acts 13, 52, and the disciples were filled with joy of the Holy Spirit. This is Jude 24, 25, kind of my prayer over us before I kind of share a couple of last thoughts here. Jude 24 tells us, it's kind of a, the end of a very short letter written by a stepbrother of Jesus to the church. And he ends this letter with this, this kind of prayer over the church that he's writing to. And he says, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless, Hear what he says, before the presence of his glory with great joy. What God is saying in this, in this short prayer is like, there's a God who is at work in your life, sanctifying us, protecting us, and one day gonna deliver us into this glory of his presence, and this is what that's gonna be full of, great joy. And what a phenomenal statement. I wanna come back to that, but I just wanna end with a couple of thoughts and questions. The question we began with is, is, is it worth it? to follow Christ. There's, there's a cost in following Jesus. And these aren't all the costs we look at here by any stretch, but there's cost of death, of loss of friends, of loss of things we care about, of, of loss of people because we're sent out and, and being in a new place, all, all sorts of things to following Jesus. And when those things come up, when they get stirred in us, if, they, if you will, they beg the question, is it worth it? What I want you to hear tonight from, from this last thought of of joy in the presence of the Lord is maybe what we need to do is change the question from is it worth it to is he worth it? And I know that just sounds like a play on words, but let me tell you why I think that's a better question to ask. What we get in Christ, if it's, if it's looked at that way of like, what do I get in Christ? Then we start to ask the question, is it worth it? Whatever I get, is it worth it? But if what we get in Christ is actually Jesus, then it begs a different question. Is he worth it? Because really what we get in Christ is him. Above all the things that God gives us, he only gives us those things through his presence. He doesn't promise us safety. He doesn't promise us health. He doesn't promise us prosperity. He doesn't promise us a great ministry. He doesn't promise us anything. What he promises is that he will be with us and never leave us or forsake us. And everything he does promise to us through the way of spiritual blessings, Ephesians 1, 3 says, are in Christ. 
And it's not just because of what Christ done that we get all those blessings, but it's because of who Christ is in us that all those blessings come to be. And He is our hope. He is our peace. He is our love. He is our mercy. And hear this, He is our joy. Now here's the question again, it's not just is it worth it, because all of those things that we get in Christ aren't it's, they're a He. And so let me reframe the question for you tonight as we end. Is He worth it? When the cost of following Jesus starts to increase around you, and it will if you're following Jesus, is He worth it? And tonight I want you to hear this verse again, and it's going to be leading just into a time I just want to pray with you, and that's this. In your presence, Lord, in your presence there's fullness of joy. In your presence there's fullness of joy. What the Lord gives to us, He says, He wants to forever keep us in. Hear the prayer again of Jude, verse 24, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. And what a promise, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless because of Christ before the presence of his glory. And here's here's what we're going to be living in, great joy. And what a what a promise. Here's, here's a couple of thoughts for us tonight as we close. Things I just want to pray over us. In order to receive the joy of God's presence, we have to be in Christ. In other words, we have to have been made right by God through Jesus Christ to know the presence of, of God's Son in us, which is joy. And so I just want to ask you this question tonight. Has, have you been made right with God through Christ so that you can know the joy of Christ, His very presence? Because if you haven't, there's There's going to be a search for joy in things. And it'll make you ask the question, is it worth it? When the question needs to be, is he worth it? And the only only way you know he is by Christ coming in to live in you as you surrender your life to the one who's died to make you right with him. And so I just want to ask you that question tonight. Have you allowed Christ to make you right with God so that you can be with him? The way we do that is to trust him, his very person and his work, that he did it enough to make us right with God. That he did enough to bring us into the presence of God so that we can know the joy of God. If you've never surrendered your life to Christ and trusted him, man, right now I'm going to pray with you and I'm just going to ask you that you would, you would say, cry out to Jesus, Jesus, save me. Make me right with you through your work and through your person. And the promise of God is this, to all call in his name. To all call in his name, he gives the right to become children of God. If we confess with our mouth, believe in our heart that Jesus is the Lord, he will save us bring His very presence into us. That is the path of life. And Psalm 1611 says this, then then you will know the presence of God and His joy. Here's the second thing I want to say to you tonight. If you're a follower of Christ, um, maybe joy has been elusive. Um, Maybe the cost of following Jesus has has ramped up lately for you and, and you've been asking the question, I'm not sure it's worth it. Maybe you haven't asked it out loud, but you started thinking in your head, I just don't know if this is worth it. And so joy's disappeared as the presence of God has grown faint in your life. And I, I just want to say this, like reframe the question, is he worth it? And start to ask your question, is, is, is my king worth it? Is his presence worth it? Is the joy that he can give worth it? And maybe you're saying right now, I don't know. And so we're going to pray tonight and ask the Lord to, to, to allow his presence to be something that starts to be known in your life over the, the next hours, even the next days. You go to bed tonight and wake up in the morning. And you would beg the Lord, Lord, I want to know the joy that that your word promises in your presence. Psalm 1611 says there's joy, fullness of joy in your presence. God, I don't, I'm not experiencing that right now. I'm not knowing that. And so we're going to ask the Lord to to make that a reality in your life that's been ripped by maybe some of the costs that have been going on that have made us wonder, is it worth it? And tonight, I want you to ask the question differently, is he worth it? So I want to pray with you, both of those sides, that some of you tonight would would tonight be the place of receiving Christ, and today would be the day of salvation. For those of you in Christ, that today would be the day he restores your joy. As David cried out in Psalm 51, restore the joy of my salvation. And praying that for you tonight. May you do that for us, Lord. Let's pray. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus for those that are, that are here tonight knowing that they've never trusted you to make them right. They've never trusted Jesus to make them right with you so that they can be with you. And tonight, I'm, I'm praying that my friend would just cry out right now, Jesus, save me. They would call out on, on the King of kings, the one who has died for our sins, the one who gave his life for us, that by his work and by his person, they would cry out to him and say, Jesus, save me. 
Save me and my son. Forgive me for my sin. Make me right with you. Cry that out to him right now. Just Jesus save me. Trust that only his work and only Jesus can do this. The word tells us in Acts, there's no other name under heaven by which we are saved or made right with God. So cry that name out. Jesus save me. The word tells us that as we call out to him, even in his name, he gives us the right to become children of God. He breathes his life into us right now, Jesus, by your name being cried out to those who know they've never been right with you. Would you make my friend right? Would you make that man, that woman, that boy, that girl, would you save them even now? Cry it out. Follower of Christ, I just want to pray what David cried out to the Lord in Psalm 51, restore the joy of my salvation. God, may tonight be a place that you begin to restore joy in those who are saved. May you restore the, the desire for your presence to be preeminent in their lives. May they tonight pray, Lord, let me be reminded that you live in me, that your presence is in me. God, could they pursue and engage your presence tonight in the morning as they wake up? Lord, I want to engage your presence. Thank you, Jesus, that you've made a way for you to be in us even now. Hebrews says that, that you've divided, you've taken down the dividing wall that separates us, the curtain that separated, and you made a way for us to draw near through Jesus. So tonight, friend, you can pray again. You can ask again as you wake up in the morning. Lord, I want to engage your presence and know your joy. I just encourage you to, to, to do that with a friend, to, to even call somebody tonight, or, or if you're sitting with somebody that can help you walk through this, talk about that, get into the Word, find places of discipleship where, again, you can step into the, the presence of the Lord and, and engage Him to, to restore joy that's been taken. So I pray this in the name of Jesus, Lord, restore joy tonight as we engage Your presence, God, as we come back to the presence of who You are, as we walk into Your presence through Jesus, restore joy. And we pray this in Your name, Jesus. Amen. And thank you for um, this time we got to spend together. I know it's been a little bit different. I pray that, that God restores joy tonight. And I pray that God for some of you is putting joy in for the first time. If that's happened, man, I want to just encourage you to reach out to someone. There's so many ways you can get in contact with us here. Always through the stream, we talk to you about ways that you can connect. There will be a, you know, text 94,000, all those things that will pop up at the end of this, I'm sure. So make sure you reach out. Don't, don't forget. Like God doesn't want you to live this alone. God wants you to be in community. So let us be a part of that with you. And you're somewhere across the world and reach out to the believers that are around you. Thanks for joining us. We love you and it's been great to be with you.